Chapter 4 Long legs are good for running, if not for dancing. Mistress B.A. was a fat woman who honored her husband, delighted in her daughter, and fed her field hands as no other housewife did for miles around. So there was a rush to be employed at B.A.'s. He too appreciated his luck at the full value when he saw the golden loaf placed at his elbow, the pot of cider set on his right, and the chunk of mild cured bacon before him. Since he lost his mother five years before, the orphan had never enjoyed such cheer, even on a feast day. He remembered, too, that his new duties of neat herd and shepherd had been fulfilled by gods and demigods. Besides, Mrs. B.A. had the management of the kind, and orders were not harsh from Catherine's mouth. You shall stay here, said she. I have made father understand that you are good for a heap of things. For instance, you can keep the accounts. Well, I know the four rules of arithmetic, said Pitu proudly. You are one ahead of me. Here you stay. I am glad, for I could not live afar from you. Oh, I beg pardon, but that came from my heart. I do not bear you ill will for that, said Catherine. It is not your fault if you like us here. Poor young lambs, they say so much in so few words. So Pitou did much of Catherine's work, and she had more time to make pretty caps and titivate herself up to use her mother's words. I think you prettier without a cap on, he remarked. You may, but your taste is not the rule. I cannot go over to the town and dance without a cap on. That is all very well for fine ladies the right to go bareheaded and wear powder on the hair. You beat them all without powder. Compliments again. Did you learn to make them at Fortier's? No, he taught nothing like that. Dancing? Lord help us, dancing at Fortier's, he made us cut capers at the end of the birch. So you do not know how to dance? Still, you shall come along with me on Sunday and see Master Isidore Charny Fit 
admitted she was to make half a dozen. It was the day for surprises. Behind the two came the hatter, who brought a three-cocked hat of the latest fashion, so full of style and elegance that nothing better was worn in Miller's Cotterets. The only trouble was that the shoes were too small for Ange. The man had made them on the last of his son, who was four years the senior of Pitou. This superiority of our friend made him proud for a space, but it was spoiled by his fear that he would have to go to the ball in his old shoes, which would mar the new suit. This uneasiness was of short duration. A pair of shoes sent for Father Billet were brought at the same time, and they fitted Pitou, a fact kept hidden from Billet, who might not like his new man literally stepping into his own shoes. When Pitou, dressed, hatted, shod, and his hair dressed, looked at himself in the mirror, he did not know himself. He grinned approvingly and said, as he drew himself up to his full height, Fetch along your master Shawnee's now. My eyes, cried the farmer, admiring him as much as the women when he strutted into the main room. You have turned out a strapper, my lad. I should like Aunt Angelique to see you thus talked out. She would want you home again. But Papa, she could not take him back, could she? As long as he is a minor, unless she forfeited her right by driving him out. But the five years are over, said Petou quickly, for which Dr. Gilbert paid a thousand francs. There is a man for you, exclaimed B.A. Just think that I am always hearing such good deeds of his. Do you see, it's life and death for him. And he raised his hand to heaven. He wanted me to learn a trade, went on the youth. Quite right of him. See how the best intentions are given a twist. A thousand francs are left to fit a lad for the battle of life, and they put him in a priest's school to make a psalm singer of him. How much did your aunt give old Fortier? Nothing. Then she pocketed Master Gilbert's money? It is likely enough. Marquis P2, I have a bit of a hint to give you. When the old humbug of a saint cracks her whistle, Demi Johns and Old Crocs, for she has been hiding her savings. But to business. Have you the Gilbert book? Here, in my pocket. Have you thought the matter over, Father? said Catherine. Good actions do not want any thought, replied the farmer. The doctor bade me have the book read, and the good principles sown. The book shall be read, and the principles scattered. But we can go to church, ventured the maid timidly. Mother and you can go to the pew, yes, but we men have better to do. Come along, Pitu, my man. Pitu bowed to the ladies, as well as the tight coat allowed, and followed the farmer, proud to be called a man. The gathering in the barn was numerous. B.A. was highly esteemed by his hired men, and they did not mind his roaring at them as long as he boarded and lodged them bounteously. So they had all hastened to come at his Besides, at this period, the strange fever ran through France felt when a nation is going to go to work. New and strange words were current in mouths, never pronouncing them. Freedom, independence, emancipation were heard not only among the lower classes, but from the nobility in the first place, so that the popular voice was but their echo. From the West came the light which illumined before it burnt. Republic of America, which was to be in its round a vast conflagration for France, by the beams of which frightened nations were to see freedom inscribed in letters of blood. So political meetings were less rare than might be supposed. Apostles of an unknown deity sprang up from heaven knows where, and went from town to town, disseminating words of hope. Those at the head of the government without understanding where the hindrance lay. Opposition was in all minds before it appeared in hands and limbs, but it was present, sensible, and the more menacing as it was intangible, like a specter, and could be premised before it was grappled with. Twenty and more 
farmers, field hands, and neighbors of B.A. were in the barn. When their friend walked in with Pitu, all heads were uncovered and all hats waved at arm's length. It was plain that these men were willing to die at the master's call. The farmer explained that the book was by Dr. Gilbert, which the young man was about to read out. The doctor was well known in the district where he owned much land, while Billet was his principal tenant. A cask was ready for the reader, who scrambled upon it and began his task. Common folks, I may almost say people in general, listen with the most attention to words they do not clearly understand. The full sense of the pamphlet escaped the keenest wits here, and B.A.'s as well. But in the midst of the cloudy phrases shone the words freedom, independence, and equality like lightnings in the dark, and that was enough for the applause to break forth. Hurrah for Dr. Gilbert, was shouted. When the book was read a third through, it was resolved to have the rest in two more sessions, next time on the Sunday coming, when all hands promised to attend. Pichu had read very well. Nothing succeeds like success. He took his share in the cheers for the language, and B.A. himself felt some respect arise for the dismissed pupil of Father Fortier. One thing was lacking to Ange, that Catherine had not witnessed his oratorical triumph. But B.A. hastened to impart his pleasure to his wife and daughter. Mother B.A. said nothing, being a woman of narrow mind. I am afraid you will get into trouble, sighed Catherine, smiling sadly. Shaw, playing the bird of ill omen again, let me tell you that I like larks better than owls. Father, I had warning that you were looked upon suspiciously. Who said so? A friend. Advice ought to be thanked. Tell me the friend's name. He ought to be well informed, as it is Viscount Isidore Charny. What makes that scented dandy meddle with such matters? Does he give me advice on the way I should think? Do I suggest how he should cut his coat? It seems to me that it would be only tarring him with the same brush. I am not telling you this to vex you, father, but the advice is given with good intention. I will give him a piece, and you can transmit it with my compliments. Let him and his upper class look to themselves. The National Assembly is going to give them a shaking up, and the question will be roughly handled of the royal pets and favorites. Warning to his brother George, the Count of Charny, who is one of the gang and on very close terms with the Austrian leech. Father, you have more experience than we, and you can act as you please, returned the girl. Indeed, said Pitu in a low voice, why does this Charny fop shove in his oar anyhow? For he was filled with arrogance from his success. Catherine did not hear, or pretended not, and the subject dropped. Pitu thought the dinner lasted a long time, as he was in a hurry to go off with Catherine and show his finery at the rustic ball. Catherine looked charming. She was a pretty, black-eyed, but fair girl, slender and flexible as the willows shading the farm's spring. She had tricked herself out with the natural daintiness setting off all her advantages, and the little cap she had made for herself suited her wonderfully. Almost the first of the stray gentlemen who condescended to patronize the popular amusement was a young man whom Pitou guessed to be Isidore Charny. He was a handsome young blade of twenty-three or so, graceful in every movement like those brought up in aristocratic education from the cradle. Besides, he was one of those who wear dress to the best harmony. On seeing his hands and feet, Pitou began to be less proud over nature's prodigality towards him in these respects. He looked down at his legs with the eye of the stag in the fable. He sighed when Catherine wished to know why he was so glum. But honest Pitou, after being forced to own the superiority of Charny as a beauty, had to do so as a dancer. Dancing was part of the training then. La 
Clausum owed his fortune at court to his skill in a Coranto in the royal quadrille. More than one other nobleman had won his way by the manner of treading a measure and arching the instep. The Viscount was a model of grace and perfection. Lord of mercy, sighed Pitu, when Catherine returned to him, I shall never dare to dance with you after seeing Lord Charney at it. Catherine did not answer, as she was too good to tell a lie. She stared at the speaker, for he was suddenly becoming a man. He could feel jealousy. She danced three or four times yet, and after another round with Isidore Charney, she asked to be taken home. That was all she had come for, one might guess. What ails you? she asked as her companion kept quiet. Why do you not speak to me? Because I cannot talk like Viscount Charney, was the other's reply. What can I say after all the fine things he spoke during the dances? You are unfair, Ange, for we were talking about you. If your guardian does not turn up, we must find you a patron. Am I not good enough to keep the farm books, sighed Pichu? On the contrary, with the education you have received, you are fitted for something better. I do not know what I am coming to, but I do not want to own it to Viscount Charney. Why refuse his protection? His brother the Count is, they say, particularly in favor at the court, and he married a bosom friend of the Queen Marie Antoinette. Lord Isidore tells me that he will get you a place in the Custom House, if you like. Much obliged, but as I have already told you, I am content to stay as I am, if your father does not why the devil should I? broke in a rough voice, which Catherine started to recognize as her father's. Not a word about Lord Isidore, whispered she to Pitu. I, I hardly know. I kind of feared I was not smart enough, stammered Ange. When you can count like one o'clock and read to beat the schoolmaster, who still believes himself a wise clerk. No, Pitu, the good God brings people to me. Once they are under my roof tree, they stick as long as he pleases. With this assurance, Pitu returned to his new home. He had experienced a great change. He had lost trust in himself, and so he slept badly. He recalled Gilbert's book. It was principally against the privileged classes and their abuses, and the cowardice of those who submitted to them. Pitu fancied he began to understand the matters better, and he made up his mind to read more of the work on the morrow. Rising early, he went down with it into the yard where he could have the light fall on the book through an open window, with the additional advantage that he might see Catherine through it. She might be expected down at any moment. But when he glanced up from his reading at the intervention of an opaque body and threadbare as his own, for Pitu had resumed his old clothes for the working day. While thrusting his head forward on a light neck, he read the book with as much curiosity as the other felt relish, though it was upside down to him. Ange was greatly astonished. A kind smile adorned the stranger's mouth, in which a few snags stuck up, a pair crossing another like boar's fangs. The American edition, said the man, snuffling up his nose, in octavo, on the freedom of men and the independence of nations, Boston, 1788. Pitu opened his eyes in proportion to the progress of the unknown reader, so that when he had reached the end, his eyes were at the utmost extent. Just so, sir, said Pitu. This is the treatise of Dr. Gilbert's, said the man in black. Yes, sir, rejoined the young man politely. He rose, as he had been taught that he must not sit in a superior's presence, and to simple Ange, everybody was a superior. In rising, something fair and rosy attracted his attention at the window. It was Catherine come down at last, who was making cautionary signs to him. I do not want to be inquisitive, sir, but I should like to know whose book this is, remarked the stranger, pointing at the book without touching it as it was between Pitou's hands. Pitou was going to say it belonged to Billet, but the girl motioned that
that he ought to lay claim to it himself. So he majestically responded, This book is mine. The man in black had seen nothing but the book and its reader and heard but these words. But he suspiciously glanced behind. Swift as a bird, Catherine had vanished. Your book? Yes. Do you want to read it? Avidus Legendi Libri, or Legendi Historiae? Hello, you appear much above the condition your clothes be seen, said the stranger. Non divis vestitu, said ingenio, and it follows that I take you into custody. Me in custody? gasped Pitu at the summit of stupefaction. At the order of the man in black, two sergeants of the Paris police seemed to rise up out of the ground. Let us draw up a report, said the man, while one of the constables bound Pitu's hands by a rope and took the book into his own possession, and the other secured the prisoner to a ring happening to be by the window. Pitu was going to bellow, but the same person who had already so influenced him seemed to hint he should submit. He submitted with a docility enchanting the policeman and the man in a black suit the trio gone in, then Pitu heard the voice, hold up your hands. He raised them, and his head as well, and saw Catherine's pale and frightened face. In her hand she held a knife. Pitu rose on tiptoe, and she cut the rope round his wrists. Take the knife, she said, and cut yourself free from the ring bolt. Pitu did not wait for twice telling, but found himself wholly free. Here is a double Louis, went on the girl. You have good legs. Make away. Go to Paris and warn the doctor. She could not conclude, for the constables appeared again as the coin fell at Pitu's feet. He picked it up quickly. Indeed, the armed constables stood on the sill for an instant, astounded to see the man free whom they had left bound. But as the dogs least stir the hair bolts, at the first move of the police, Pitu made a prodigious leap and was on the other side of the hedge. They uttered a yell which brought out the corporal, who held a little casket under the arm. He lost no time in speech-making, but darted after the escaped one. His men followed his example, but they were not able to jump the hedge and ditch like Pitu, and were forced to go roundabout. But when they got over, they beheld the youth five hundred paces off on the meadow, tearing away directly to the woods, a quarter of a league distant, which he would gain in a short time. He turned at the snake, and perceiving the enemy take up the chase, though more for the name of the thing than any hope of overtaking him, he doubled his speed and soon dashed out of sight in the thicket. He had the wind as well as the swiftness of the buck, and he ran for ten minutes as he might for an hour. But, judging that he was out of danger, by his instinct he stopped to breathe, listen, and make sure that he was quite alone. It is incredible what a quantity of incidents have been crammed into three days, he mused. He looked alternately at his coin and the knife. I must find time to change the gold and give Miss Catherine a penny for the night, for fear it will cut our friendship. Never mind, since she bade me go to Paris, I shall go. On making out where he 